It's October 3rd, 2024, and here's a car update for the channel. This is my, as the license plate says, 1987 Jaguar XJS. This is the Cabriolet. I don't know how much of this I've shown on the channel before. I kind of alluded to it and pointed at it in the last garage update, but that was quite some time. And I think I did a startup video of it a while ago, but uh, this might be the first time I've actually done a little tour of it since it's been mostly fixed up and working well-ish. So um, for those unfamiliar, this is a 87 XJS Cabriolet, which means it has the, uh, it's not a convertible and it's not a coupe. It's got the two removable roof panels and then a little convertible top here on the back. Uh, very unique body style, something that was kind of common in the late 80s due to um, potential outlawing of convertibles in the US and such which never ended up happening, but uh, that was the solution of many car manufacturers, which is why you see a lot of 80s cars with a T-top, for example. Um, these are, I would say, bordering on rare. Um, they're not, they're somewhat rare. Uh, they made 5,013 of these, of the uh, this body style, and of those, half of those went to the US, less of them were the V12s, less of them of this color, I don't know. You know, it's it's one of 5,000 and certainly one of very, very <laughs> less than 5,000 now because I'm sure they've been crushed or junked over the years. So yeah, pretty unique car. Um, I like it. It's got the 5.3 liter V12, three-speed automatic, and it's comfortable. Um, it still needs a lot of suspension work, basically just replacing all the suspension components because it's all approaching 40 years old at this point. But it rides pretty well, it runs pretty well, and uh, it's nice. But I still am trying to sell this because as much as I like it, um, I would just rather something else. Because even though it's working well now, I know it's going to go wrong again. And yeah, I can fix it, but then it's just going to sit in the garage for another, I don't know, two years while I slowly work on it, while I have the money and while I have the time and... That's no fun. I want to get out there and actually drive it. So right now it is drivable. And I've actually coincidentally been driving it not that much <laughs> to keep it in a drivable state. Um, I've been tracking all the, the issues that I know about and none of them have really gotten any worse. So, you know, I drive it occasionally, but I don't drive it really that much. Not as much as I would like to, you know, out of a summer joyride car. So, yeah. Um, I guess since we're just talking about it, overall it's in pretty decent condition. As you can see, the you know it's got some issues. It's got little you know scratches. This is I think a little ding. Um, there's only one big dent, unfortunately. It's this one in the back. I'm just gonna leave it because I don't know. It doesn't bother me that much. What does bother me is some of the rust, and that's a little unfortunate. There's this, and it's on the other side. It's very similar. These are just really really crispy and uh, most of the rest of the car is pretty okay but then we get to see if i can go under here we get to that um as far as i know that was not entirely caused by this being a northeast car you know driven when it was new in the salt because it was new and who cares it's new uh unfortunately the uh the floor pans right up where it kind of goes up, so flat to up, are quite rotted out, and subsequently the jacking points that are right there have been rotted out. So that's not great. Um, does it interfere with inspection? Because I guess it doesn't matter, or maybe nobody really cares, but that is uh, another issue. Overall, though, rust, not that bad. It's just the normal places where you'd expect it to be. You know, the, the quarter panel back here and on the other side, the door on the other side has a little bit, and then, um, and, and then those those two points I mentioned down on the floor. And what I meant to actually mention was, I think the reason for it rotting out is not entirely because of road salt and such that we have here. I know for a fact because when I got it, I left it outside for a couple of days with the roof on. Um, the the entire floor flooded. And I eventually determined there are two things going on. One, there's two, uh, there's two scuttle drains, I think. They drain, this is the windshield wiper assembly. It just kind of drains here, here, and then it goes out into the wheel well, which is kind of a strange 
place for it to go, but I guess it makes sense. Those were completely packed solid. Absolutely nothing was getting through them. I cleared them out, so that meant this could finally drain. That improved things, but it didn't actually fix anything. Um, the, the real issue is that, especially over here in like the corners, this is, I mean, this is hard as a rock and it's, it's brittle and just gross. Anytime it would rain, it would go down here, it would seep under here, and oh, more than seep, it would pour into there and then pour directly into the floor. So I think years of that happening has really rotted the floors out, in addition to road salt, of course, but I really think that was the main thing. That also meant when I got it, it had a lot of electrical gremlins, and eventually I determined that was due entirely to four of the relays, the four relays, in fact, all four of them that are underneath there, completely full of water. You could take them, you could shake them a little bit, and you could hear water sloshing around. So after that, and a couple other little electrical gremlins. This thing has been surprisingly good for British, British car electrics from the 80s. Uh, not really any issues whatsoever, so that was nice. Uh, let's actually take a quick look in the engine bay. Actually, we'll open this up first, because uh, I cleaned it up quite a bit recently. I wiped down everything, I vacuumed a lot, and that really did it. This, it, it's in pretty nice condition on the inside. Let me turn off this fan, get rid of the fan noise. Um, pretty nice condition, definitely signs of some wear. I mean, the seat's a little bit worn, but it's not torn, it's not destroyed or anything. It's, it's pretty nice in here. Um, yeah, it's pretty nice in here, but let's take a look under the hood. I love the door sound on these. It sounds very, very heavy, very secure. You don't have to put the phone down. There we go. Opens up this way. And in the in the words of a Doug DeMuro review of the XJS V12, here's the whole mess. And yeah, it's it's something. Now, now that I've worked on it for countless hours and countless days. I'm a little more familiar with it. It makes a lot more sense. It's not as scary. But just because it isn't a scary engine doesn't mean it's not a huge pain in the ass to work on. And this sucks to work on. As you would expect, you know, it's a very tightly packed engine bay. It's a V12 and it's old, an old school V12. So there's a lot of things that are probably larger on the engine that would be smaller today. I don't know. But yeah, everything is uh, quite packed in here. So I've spent a lot of time in the center of the engine, actually. So I replaced all the ignition stuff, um, the gaskets, the cap, the rotor, all the spark plug wires, the spark plugs. That was my first intro to this car, actually, was doing the spark plugs. And I almost wanted to sell it <laughs> immediately after I did that because it took forever. It took so long. But we got there in the end. And uh, I did learn my lesson, I guess. So I did that, I did the fuel rail. So the fuel rail here, um, you can see maybe a design flaw. I don't know how many other engines are like this, but we have the thing that generates all the spark, the distributor, um, right? I can't point to it. Um, the thing with all the spark plug wires coming off of it. And then right there, we have a fuel line, a fuel injector. Right there, we have one. So directly next to this thing that is constantly making spark, we have these little pieces of fuel hose. And when they turn, I don't know, 30, 40 years old, they're just really brittle and they crack and they spray fuel. Fortunately, that didn't happen to mine, but it is probably the number one cause for engine fires in this engine. And it's very common. The fuel lines get brittle, they crack, and then lights on fire. I did actually have one split. <laughs> trying to hold this hood open with my hand because it doesn't really stay open by itself. I'm getting tired. Um, this one right here, this one split, split right about, I don't know, right there. And it started spraying fuel. Unfortunately, I had the hood open and I was in my garage and I heard it and then I saw it and I shut the engine off. Otherwise, if this engine had been, if the engine bay had been closed, I had been driving and that burst, absolutely would have caught on fire, no doubt about it. 
even though it's not right in the middle, it would have caught fire. So that's that's one of the reasons people uh, rip out these engines because they're a little difficult to work on. They're honestly they're not terribly unreliable. It's just working on things to replace things that fail is so difficult people don't want to do it and then they say the engines are unreliable because they didn't replace something that was failing at some point so uh, you know i don't i don't hate the engine um i just i find it a huge pain in the ass to work on and that's well that's about it so yeah i've done all that oh, hopefully that's still recording low battery on my phone I've done all that. I replaced the electric coolant fan. I did all the coolant lines. I did the mechanical coolant fan and clutch. Um, the brake master cylinder. Probably a bunch of other things too in here. I know I've spent a lot of time in here. Uh, primarily because it takes so long to work on everything. Oh, the AAV. I rebuilt that. So It's been a journey. And I honestly hope that I can sell this to somebody who really appreciates the car and all the work that has been done because it would be a real shame to have somebody buy this, rip the engine out of it, um, and make it not, you know, it kind of ruins the point of the comfy Jag to put a V8 in something that has a comfortable V12 in it. I don't know, that's just my two cents, but we'll see what happens. Anyway, um, that's an update on the Jag. I've you know, it runs pretty well. It's got a couple little issues, but taking it to the car show this weekend, and I'm excited for people to be able to see it. Um, I have, a, there's a Discord group for that car meet, and everybody, I posted a couple pictures, and not everybody, but a lot of people were like, wow, that looks awesome. You should really bring that. We don't have a lot of 80s cars, and certainly not a lot of Jags, and there's actually a guy local who responded to me. He's got an XJ6. I think it's a 1986. And he's going to drive here with it if it makes it. He's not sure. Um, and then we're going to drive to the car meet together. So we can park next to each other, two Jags next to each other. That'll be fun. So that is the Jag. I don't know what else to say about it. It's here. I, again, desperately want to sell it. I know I'm going to look back at this video in 10 years and be like, damn. I should not have sold this. At this point, I'm not in for a ton of money. Um, I'm in for about what it's worth. Is this, are these XJSs gonna be, you know, the new E-Type in 30 years? Who knows? But I, I definitely have a feeling I'm gonna be kicking myself over wanting to sell this so badly, but I, I do. You know, life is too short to just have something in your garage you don't want. There's so many other cars out there that I want to own, that I want to drive. It would be a shame to just have this sitting here and not being driven when I could have something that I actually want to drive now. Um, so yeah, that's that. Anyway, last thing I'll talk about real quick, because there's nothing else to talk about in the garage really, is the uh, Land Rover Discovery. I just put new tires on it, and it desperately needed tires. It needed tires so badly. The ones that were on it, they were winter tires, just uh, the rock hard uh, started, I think I showed it in the last vlog, it started to uh, dry rot and, and crack and it was actually leaking in that right corner. And yeah, it was time for new tires. So I put these on, these make it ride so much better. It's so much quieter, everything is nicer, they look a little better. I wasn't actually able to get this one replaced because myself and the shop I took it to could not get the spare tire off. This is original. Um, I don't know where the date code is, but it is from 2004 when this car was new and all these lugs are seized. So I, I'm i gonna have to open up the, the back hatch here. Well, there's me. Um, I'll have to open up the back and then uh, unbolt the carrier and see if I can drill out these studs. I already purchased a new carrier, but I need to, of course, drill out the studs so I can get the wheel off and then I'll put the wheel on the new carrier and hopefully all will be well. Um, on this also, I just replaced the right exhaust manifold. That also really needed to be done. It Well, I guess it didn't really need to be done. Both of the um, manifolds have been done at this point because they were just ticking, leaking. They made a little ticking sound because of exhaust leaks. And after taking it apart, yeah, the gaskets had 
very, very clear leaks in them. And after putting everything back together, sealing it up, it sounds great. I'm really happy with that. Um, I did a little bit of cleaning up and well, just tidying up really in here. I uh, don't know if I showed it in the last video. I 3D printed some horn buttons. <coughs> Excuse me for this. These, um, I, I'll just re-explain it. I don't know if I talked about it. These, over time, the original ones shrink a little bit just due to heat changes and stuff. And then they just pop out because there's a spring behind them. And they're not broken. You just you can't put them back in because they just pop right back out. So I was able to find a uh, file online for these. And I think they look pretty darn good. I mean, they're clearly 3D printed, but they look they look good. So I printed two of those, put them in there, and they've stayed in ever since. So I'm really happy for that, because this isn't a replacement part. Uh, Land Rover never made these as a replacement because it just wasn't something you would really have to replace, I guess. Um, you could get the whole assembly. There's like a horn assembly. It's like a bar and then some wires. And then you could have got this with it, but those are pretty much unable to be found at this point. Um, also another little fix that I did here, the uh, this dash binnacle, I think that's what it's called. I don't remember the term for it. Uh, the clips up here are broken, so it just kind of flopped around. But also the, the little studs up down here were broken, so if you just take a screw and then you screw it through, there's a, a mount back there and it just it holds everything in. <laughs> so I have two screws holding my dash together, which pretty on par for an old British vehicle. And uh, last little improvement I did, I bought this, I've had this, I've had the Ultra Gauge for ever, I don't know, 10 years now. And uh, it works great. This It's kind of something that a lot of people put in these. And uh, it shows me like engine temperature and I can't think of anything else. A couple other things. I have six gauges on here. Um, and somebody makes a mount that's 3D printed that connects right up here. And then you just, you put it there and it's a great spot for it. It's, it's molded to the, um, this piece of plastic on the A pillar and it just snaps on and it's really nice. It's in a nice spot because before I had it down there in the little ashtray and it was fine, but then you have to kind of look down to, to look at it, which wasn't great. Um, also another, you know, just talking about things I've done to this recently, I gave everything a, a pretty good thorough cleaning. And one of the things I did was I wanted to clean out the seats. Now there's, they're still not perfect. I didn't really get out all the like dirt stains and stuff, but they do look a lot better. And a big part of that was all these holes filled with just dirt and sand and, and all sorts of stuff. And they're kind of hard to clean because they're perforated leather and stuff gets in them, especially in the back seat. Some stuff was spilled like paint at some point. So I was sitting there poking every little hole out and that sucked. So what I found out I could do is I've got one of those like, like muscle massagers for like your leg. And uh, it's like a little massage gun. And I just held it on there and it massages and it beats all the stuff out of the seat. And it's just a big cloud of like sand and crap. So I do that and vacuum it up. I do it again, vacuum it up. And that seat, I would say almost turned a different color. It actually got lighter because all the holes were no longer filled with junk. So that was kind of entertaining. But yeah, I mean, it's not perfect. It's got 171,000 miles and it wasn't very well cared for before it got to me. So you know, no surprises there. Um, oh, let's keep talking about little fixes I did. Um, door check pin, I think that's what it's called. The one that was in here originally, um, well, it, it wasn't there anymore. The, the hole basically for the check pin is bigger on the part that attaches here than it is the actual thing. <laughs> I don't know what the hell it's called. And no matter what check pin you put in there, it, it still makes a popping noise because it's just too big. So I put a drywall anchor in there because I got frustrated. I, I was working on this for like two hours. I was hot. I was frustrated. My back hurt from sitting weird trying to get to this. So I just put a drywall anchor through it and then put a screw in there. Now, a little bit of a creak, but that's not from that. That's just from the hinge. So it no longer pops all the time. And that game changer. <laughs> that was really nice. 
Um, yeah. Anyway, going on 20 minutes now of just rambling about stuff, I think that's probably good. So there's the little update on the cars. Um, I don't know what else is really going to change about the XJS, except it's going to be gone eventually, I hope. So I don't know if there'll be another video on that. Maybe I'll make a video of it driving or something, but we'll see what happens. This, the Discovery, I plan on keeping a long time. So if something exciting comes up and I'm you know, able to make a video of it, I will. But you can expect to see that on the channel again. It'll be around forever. Um, I really love that car. So anyway, that is that. Um, if you watched to the end, thank you very much for watching. I'm glad you're interested in these two British S-boxes. And uh, yeah, we'll see you in the next video.